If you were an African-American kid um, in Winter Garden who wanted to go to high school, you had to get on the bus and go to Orlando. So uh, they said, well, no, they need to go to school just like everybody else. As a community, we need to start having conversations together that matter. Who are we now? Who were we then? And who are we going to be in the future? Let's slow down to think and discuss. This is Afterthought. Hello, everyone. I'm Austin Arthur, and this is Afterthought, a new show where we're going to focus on history, our heritage, and our community. For our first episode, I have a great guest, Jim Crescitelli. Yes, sir. Welcome, Jim. Thank you. Uh, for those of you who have been around West Orange and Winter Garden, you might have know Jim already or have seen him around. Perhaps you've been on one of his wonderful bike tours. Uh, Jim is uh, a native born from New York who moved here in the late 70s to the Winter Park, West Orange, Winter Garden area. And uh, he is also the operations and program director at the Winter Garden Heritage Foundation. Right. So if you don't mind, Jim, just tell us a little bit about yourself, how you got involved with West Orange in general, and a little bit of your background. Okay, so in other words, how somebody from Brooklyn ended up in Winter Garden. Exactly. Well, I finished college in 1978 and um, looked south, attracted to Florida, came down in 1978 to Winter Park, and uh, just started exploring right after that. I was very curious about the area outside of Park Avenue and the parks and Disney and downtown Orlando. And I started asking people, well, you know, I've got this road atlas and there's so much out west of here. Look at that giant lake. What is Lake Apopka? And what are these towns, Tildenville and Beulah and Oakland and Winter Garden? What's Okoe? And people would say, uh, you really don't want to go out to West Orange County. There's not much out there. It's very rural. They're different people. So stick around. I says, well, now you've given me, you know, reason to get in the car and go exploring. And I did. And there I discovered orange groves and, and vegetable fields and old mansions and little rundown communities in the middle of nowhere. And I was quite fascinated by all that. And I wanted to know the history of it. So I started taking a lot of pictures, writing notes. And uh, that kind of led to a real fascination with the history of West Orange County, really different from uh, where I live in okay. Winter Park in Orlando. Yeah. yeah. Now, very different from uh, Winter Park, very different from Brooklyn. Yes. Extremely. In those days, however, I imagine Winter Garden was even much different than it is now, even yes. in the late 70s, early 80s. Yeah. Um, it had gone through an economic downturn. There were still mm. people living in the area, working and living. I mean, it was a community of people. It just didn't have the vibe, let's say, that it has today. It kind of had its... Um, its major heyday with citrus. When the parks came through, property started being sold off. Then, of course, the freezes that we had in the 1980s kind of brought these little communities down here to um, a shadow of what they used to be. So when I started driving through and taking pictures, things were very quiet. Uh, Two-lane roads, quiet streets, dirt roads, very different, yeah. peaceful and quiet you right. just didn't have you didn't have the you didn't, you didn't have, have the winter garden the, um, villages you mean yeah exactly yeah <laughs> yeah yeah i want to talk different. about that i want to talk about what happened in the 80s in these different time periods let's go back a little bit if you will mm -hmm. to the to the beginning let's go back as far as as you would like to go back maybe the early settler period and what that yeah, was sure like. yeah farmers came here um after the three seminole wars Things happen like that in history. Not the greatest time in our history, but the state was opened up to settlement. Uh, people came here, farmers mainly from the Deep South, South Carolina, Alabama, Mississippi, those states, Virginia, and this was what, what yeah, what like decade? in the in mid eighteen hundreds, yeah. So before, the first right before the Civil War, yeah, uh huh. Yeah. They arrived here like in the eighteen fifties, eighteen fifty seven, eighteen fifty eight. Bought property, started setting up homesteads, a lot of vegetable farming, some citrus in the beginning. And uh, the communities sprung up like that. Beulah, for example, mm -hmm. just south of here is even older than Winter Garden. A lot of people live there originally. Oakland is very old as well. Right. Winter Garden established itself a little bit later than those towns when the two railroad lines finally came through by 1899. Mm -hmm. And uh, downtown Winter Garden grew up right along Plant Street along the, the railroad tracks and uh, the tracks on the next block south. Tavares and Gulf. Right. So once the railroads came and started shipping out citrus and produce by the carload, we were really on the map. Wow. Downtown got bigger and bigger. Houses were built north and south of downtown. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We were a whole working community incorporated by 1908. 
by 1908. So before they they were actually incorporated, was the downtown Winter Garden already kind of a bustling place with the train coming in there? Uh, Yeah, it was busy. It was a busy stop on Mm -hmm. the Atlanta Coastline Railroad by the time that was renamed. Right. And yeah, uh, the corner of Plant Street and Main Street where the Winter Garden Heritage Museum is, that was the third depot for the um, train that ran along Plant Street. So that was the heart of the city. We have photos from about 1907, 1908 that show a lot of wooden businesses ranged along Plant and mm-hmm. Main and Boyd Streets. The ones on Plant and Main burned a couple of times in the wow. before 1912. And uh, when they finally rebuilt, uh, they built in brick. They rebuilt in brick. So a lot mm-hmm. of the buildings you see downtown, especially at Plant and Main, those buildings survive from at least 1912. Wow, so yeah. we've really kept our architectural legacy. Because of that brick, the decision to go to brick. And I imagine that was yeah. because some of the wood buildings probably burned down. Yeah, and they, they figured, you know, brick. we could make our own bricks. We could import bricks. They're mm-hmm. not going to burn. Not like wood would. Exactly. Yeah. Now, do we know much about how Winter Garden was affected in during the Civil War? The people of Winter Garden, were they kind of isolated from that? Or Yeah, do, do there's know not much? really a Civil War history. Not much documentary. Um, yeah. We had people who were settled in Oakland, for example, in uh-huh. the late 19, 1850s. Uh, one of the families decided to just pack up and go back, back home, back to Texas. They were going to oh. go to Texas. And uh, when they got to the Mississippi River, they had to turn back because... You know, the war had prevented any crossing. So they came back to Florida, resettled themselves in this area. Wow. So, yeah, it wasn't really a, not a, as far as we know, not a big yeah. civil war. Not much stop. in the records to give us much of a, of a story about what was going on. Then perhaps they were kind of isolated being out here, maybe. Yeah. I know Florida wasn't too much involved in the war effort. I think maybe Florida was more involved in. Mostly the northern part. Yeah, of the giving state. cattle yeah. To, to feed the army and this sort of thing, I believe, yeah. anyhow. Okay, so it was 1908, you said it was incorporated, mm-hmm. right? The city was officially incorporated in 1908, correct. And did people, were people originally drawn to, the, to Lake Apopka? Is that kind of what brought people this way? Or? Well, that became a um, tourist destination. Uh-huh. It's so, sometimes I think of it as our first golden age from 1910 to maybe the end of the 1920s when the brick buildings were up. The mm-hmm. Shelby Hotel, Tony's Liquors, was built um, in 1913. 1913. 1913. Tony's Liquors, right there where we could go yeah, and get a drink after you this. You got it. Cool place. That's fascinating. And... Uh, yeah, it kind of um, just exploded around that time. Everybody um, was either in citrus or agriculture, and a lot of people did very well. You said they went from uh, just general produce and then towards more towards citrus later on. Was that towards... Yeah, there was some citrus growing. It started to do pretty well. In 1894, 1895, there was this freeze that knocked out the entire citrus industry. Wow. A lot of people left. It kind of did this area in for quite a few years. Uh-huh. Um handful of families stayed, bought property on the cheap, right. just kept their, um, even if they didn't have groves, they planted vegetables until the replanted orange seedlings could come I to see. fruition in a few years. A lot of people wisely stayed and uh, mm-hmm. made a lot of money off of vegetables. And by the time the orange trees were ready to fruit again, about five or six years later, they were up and running and wow. never looked back. And you said that was in the 1880s, did I 1894, 1895. 1895. Yeah. So it was kind of like a hundred years later, something similar happened. Yeah, just about. Mm-hmm. Yeah, in the eight, 1980s, 1980, right? 1980, 1984, 1989, I believe those dates Interesting. were. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. So so by the time the, after the big freeze of the, you know, turn around the turn of the century mm-hmm. there, citrus started to come back. Was, is that when it was really just all about the citrus in Winter Garden? Is that a true assumption that it was at some point all about the citrus? Well, there were still vegetables, but citrus eventually outpaced outpaced it. Yeah. Yeah, but there were a lot of vegetable fields. Some people just preferred to grow vegetables. Mm-hmm. Uh, a lot of people went into citrus. You need a lot of um, property for citrus, a lot of yeah. fertilizer, a lot of water. You have to be able, you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and a lot of people did, but it became the major cash crop eventually right i see yeah. and then i guess a lot of the businesses the pe- the the town folks would benefit as you said they started to come to lake apopka for tourism yeah the early turn of the century 1910 to 1920 um and but 1927 they had built the edgewater hotel to accommodate those tourists i see so that um helped to draw them to town also a lot of famous people came to um winter garden to fish in lake apopka it was a big deal the largemouth bass capital of the world right and uh the hotel has fish gutting sinks 
on their floors where you could actually gut and clean your catch and then hand it over to the uh, cook oh, to fry no, it for your they, supper. And yeah, fry it for you. The cook yeah. did. That was wow, a so, big it, deal. so it wasn't just that you'd go and do some fishing. It was like a total experience yeah, from the hotel. Yeah, if you stayed in the edge the... water, they'll cook your fish. Yeah, we have tons of pictures of people standing there with their, their catch. Two dozen fish camps around the lake. Really? And they all were doing well. They yeah. were bustling. Yeah. yeah. Wow. So there's so many things. So I guess not to jump too much ahead in time, but... That's no, okay. That's when... That changed when it was... When the pollution started happening. Is that right? Do I have this correct? With it? Yeah, that, there was a, that was a slow burn, shall we say, when mm-hmm. the lake kind of lost its life. A yeah. lot of different factors affected it. Right. Yeah, mm-hmm. and by... um. By the 70s, I guess the lake wasn't viable as a uh, fishing mm-hmm. capital anymore. It took a while. So do we know exactly where this pollution was really coming from? and what A lot was of different it? factors, yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, there was a uh, sewer plant in Winter Garden. There was a citrus processing plant in Oakland. There was a chemical fertilizer plant in Montverde on the west side. And on the north shore of Lake Apopka, in 1941, they had drained about 20,000 acres of uh, marshland so they could plant for the war effort. Oh. And that was for World War II. That was our contribution to the war. And that was, that was truck farming and vegetables up there. So uh, you've got to throw fertilizer and pesticides on your crops. It's the 1940s. Who knows? Nobody's really thinking no one, of no that. One, everyone's kind of innocent about that. Yeah. You can dump it in the water, it goes away. We don't see yeah, it, right? Exactly. That's kind of mentality. So they had built a, exactly. They had built a dike wall between the lake and the new you know, drained marshland. And mm-hmm. a couple of times a year, they would open the floodgates and irrigate their crops. Right. And the water would be pumped back into the lake, bringing uh, all those nutrients. And the nutrients yeah. did, did the fish in, did the plants in, which did the fish in. And uh, eventually, it was just like a green pond scum uh, uh, covering the whole surface of the lake, yeah. algae, and it couldn't breathe. It basically suffocated. And any life in it also did. That's all stopped. There's no more pollution going in the lake, and it's there's a major effort, as you know, yes. to bring it back to life. Friends of Lake Apopka had a big hand in that, starting, I think, in the 70s. Oh, oh really? So that right early on, yeah. even, the effort yeah. was beginning. Really good, dedicated people. Wow. I always think of that lake as the battery of the area. Mm-hmm. The Native Americans lived and worked around it. The settlers did. It kept everybody charged, mm-hmm. water and game and fishing. The right. battery got discharged by the 70s. Life around it kind of just died. Right. Now it's being recharged again. Now, the city of Winter Garden has gotten behind that effort, I understand. Is that correct, too, to really help with the uh, revitalization yeah, of the lake? Yeah, everybody, and stuff? Um, all the municipalities, most all Should the all municipalities all around, yeah. around the um, lake mm-hmm. want to, a concerted effort to uh, engage in, hopefully, ecotourism by I understand cleaning up they, that lake. They put a whole bunch of bass in there uh, recently, Yeah, right? they seeded it with bass. You know, they do that every couple of years. Oh, it's yeah. every couple of years. Yeah, yeah. Okay. They've tried that, and um, people report that they're catching bass. So Okay, we'll so see. it's certainly not back to where it was in terms of quality, but it's getting no, there, we think? it's or? getting there, yeah. yeah. Still a long way to go, realistically. Mm-hmm. Sure. But um, you can actually see your arm if you put it in the lake now. <laughs> I took a kayak tour in February last year uh, from... Magnolia Park down uh-huh. to Crown Point. Oh, okay. That was about 24 of us. That was great. Oh, and it wow. Was, it's just so beautiful. It's this yes. major asset that, you know, we should take good care of. And we yeah. are. It's a lot better than it was. And that's that's fantastic that we, we live in a time where we can actually have an afterthought and think about our actions before, our mistakes, and yeah. to improve them. And I think that's why history is so important, to learn yeah. from it. you learn from it, you mm-hmm. try to improve on it, and not do the same thing again. Yeah. Exactly. You mentioned the uh, Shelby Hotel and the Edwater Hotel. Yeah. Now, the Shelby Hotel was first, right? Is that correct? And yeah, they... on the corner, that, Tony's Liquors, they built that in 1913. Uh, the same gentleman who built the building where Savory is, the uh-huh. Dildon Boyd building, went up in 1912. The Shelby followed in 1913. So yeah, that was the two-story hotel, the first one. Right. And then the Edgewater went up in 1927. Wow. And now you could go, folks can go to the Edgewater now yes. and visit it. What's that experience like? You can stay like? there and, too, yeah. And you can actually stay inside the stay Edgewater. There. It's a bed and breakfast, yeah. Second floor rooms, and they're putting rooms in on the third floor as well. Well, so 90 years old. Yeah, it was it, a few decades it was closed, you know, when downtown had its downturn. That was the first project of the Winter Garden Heritage Foundation to uh-huh. keep the Edgewater from being demolished. Excellent. And uh, then some people actually took it, yes. bought it. So you guys do a, a lot of good for our community. Yeah, we try. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. We try to educate people as 
to why they're here and what they should know about what came before them, then you appreciate it more. Exactly. Yeah. That's exactly how I feel. Totally. Now, the Edgewater Hotel, though, I'm not able to go bring a fish and have them cook it up for me like the no, old days. No, I don't think so. Oh. I mean, you could ask. Uh, you never know. You yeah, never maybe know. they got a little station. I gotta, we got to check yeah, it out. Yeah, I don't know if they do. Yeah, it's a... Uh, you sit at a communal table for breakfast. It's like a, like oh. a B&B, yeah. Very fun. But, um, you know, why not? You should ask. We if will, you catch yeah. something, ask if they'll Maybe one of the viewers will you. know and write in the comments and tell there us about go. it. Tell me about Winter Gardens first, our first mayor. I understand he was just like almost like the first of almost everything, right? Mr. First, yeah. <laughs> How did you hear about Arthur Bullard Newton? You know about this I, guy, don't you? I study you. I, l- I listen you to you over the years. There you go. <laughs> yeah, he was um, Mr. First. He was a uh, he was in the legislature. He uh, came to town from Mississippi in 1892, set up the first store, apparently the first citrus packing house. He was wow. the postmaster. He had the first business, first newspaper. We have a copy of that newspaper, actually, from 1905, an original copy, the Ricochet. Wow. Yeah, so he four ran pages. The press he and ran the government. The press. Yep, he ran everything. <laughs> he wouldn't get away with that today. Yep. <laughs> nope, he covered the waterfront, yep. And was he, he very popular in his time with the contemporaries? Um, as far as I know, I've never heard anything you know bad about him mm-hmm. um, or just untoward, but uh, he mostly... Stores. So you think he had four locations for stores in the area oh. all his life. Yeah, mm-hmm. he was a first smart and guy. A yeah, mm-hmm. First and foremost, a businessman. Yeah, first and foremost, a businessman. Um, I think his second store on the uh, corner of Boyd and Plant, where um, Carrie Fleck Building is right now, mm-hmm. the Fleck Building, they um, he had painted actually on the front with whitewash what he sold inside. So we have photos that um, you see his store saying that they've got hats and shoes and notions and oh, things like great. that. Yeah. Smart guy. Wow, that's fascinating. Yeah, he did a lot. Now, do we have any um, kind of uh, homages to him in the community that you're aware of? Any kind of tributes or anything like this to the first mayor? There's no monuments around. Um, Mm -hmm. There is something I would like to mention. He's buried in the Okoy Cemetery on Mm -hmm. Geneva Road, the beautiful little space just east of Blueford. And um, it's a flat marker in the ground. Mm Mm-hmm. Humble. Be nice if it was marked and known, yeah. you know, something. Yeah, but yeah. he was like such a pioneer, that guy. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but you would think humble. Yeah. Yeah. Just a flat marker in the ground. But right. yeah, there he is. That's the kind of stuff that I care about. You know, people who really made an impact in their communities, did good for others. We need to remember those people because we need to learn from them. That's our heritage. Exactly. You know? Yeah. I mean, they were basically businessmen. They put a lot of people to work. Mm-hmm. Those people spent money in their towns. They built houses. They put their kids in school. Right. They created a whole economy, basically. Yeah. yeah the business people. All right. I have another question. Sure. And then we're going to move into a little bit uh, the next time period, you know, the middle of the century. Where did the name Winter Garden come from? What is this Winter Garden? Yeah, there's a lot of theories. Uh, basically, they all boil down to the fact that you could have a garden in the winter. Um, mm-hmm. There's stories of uh, train workers or street workers spitting tomato seeds into the soil. And, you know, when they went back a few weeks later, there were tomato plants. <laughs> and people coming here would send postcards back and say, you should move here. It's really beautiful. It's it's not even cold in the winter. You've got to have a garden. Yeah. So winter garden. Yeah. Basically the there idea. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. So they'd write back to their family. You've got to come. You've got to come. Have a winter. Have a, have a garden, garden during the winter. winter. Yeah. Fantastic. I have a couple more people I want to talk about because I want people to know about them. Mm-hmm. What can you tell me about William Maxey? William Maxey, great guy, great guy. We include him and his wife, Juanita, yes. in our, our Citizen Heroes uh, uh, presentation that we do for school kids. We do field trips for about 1,500 kids a year. Mm. And uh, we go into detail about the Maxies in the second grade field trip. And they came down to Central Florida from Jacksonville in 1937, I think. Mm-hmm. Um, college educated teachers, professors, and they um, saw a need in Winter Garden. A lot of the African American kids, of course, in the days of segregation. Right. So uh, they said, well, no, they need to go to school just like everybody else. And apparently they were attending a little wooden Rosenwald school in Winter Garden, which mm-hmm. was put up by the Rosenwald Fund, but small. And mm-hmm. the kids didn't go to school regularly. They were expected to go work outdoors. That's how it was in those days. Yes. So they said, uh uh-uh. uh. And, uh, by hook, by crook, raising money by doing things like selling catfish sandwiches and and, and uh, uh, peanuts. They raised funds a little bit, got money here and there from people, donations, and they expanded the school, moved it to a bigger lot. 
and over the years added a room here, a room there, hired more teachers. It took a long time. There wasn't a lot of support from the school board in those days. And even of segregation. Back, I, I, yeah. I imagine. And um, eventually, uh, William Maxey became the principal of Charles R. Drew High School for mm-hmm. African American kids in Winter Garden. Wow. We finally got a high school, 12 grades all the way through. It took a long time. Before that, if you were an African American kid um, in Winter Garden who wanted to go to high school, you had to get on the bus and go to Orlando. Uh, yeah. But that stopped with the advent of the high school. The Maxey family. Yeah. And his wife taught, I understand. She yeah, she was a teacher. Years. Yeah. Uh huh. She um, passed it. Over a hundred years years of age, yeah. No kidding. Yeah, they were a wow. great couple. They did a lot of good for the community. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So many small towns, especially in those days, never had people like them to stand up for for these African American kids and give them the kind of opportunity they deserved. So that's somebody I think we really need to focus more on as a community. Now I know we have the Maxi school that just popped up, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. There was one closer in, close to the school where it is now. A few blocks okay, away, okay. but it was small, and um, this new one is greatly expanded, of course. Yeah, I pass by it yeah. every day. It's right yeah. where I live, actually. Exactly. So that's great. That's 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 a great thing to honor them, both him and his wife. That yeah. way, people who really and it wasn't it just that they. Um, and of course, they improved the lives of African American mm-hmm. kids and their families. But um, you know, we always tell the second graders, if not everybody in the community is educated equally. How good can that community really, you know, be? Absolutely. It can be better when everybody is educated Absolutely. equally, and that's Equal what they, that's what they understood. Yeah. Okay. What about another one, George McMillan? George McMillan, yeah, the Flying Tiger, hometown boy, McMillan family, McMillan Citrus, McMillan Groves, mm-hmm. uh, really nice family. I, I know, I know some of their members. They're oh, really you? cool people. So they're still around. The yeah, uh-huh. in the community. or they live out some. Yeah, I but see. Uh, they're good folks, and. Um, George grew up on Lakeview Avenue, I believe that house, and uh, went to war, World War II, of course, signed on with the uh, Flying Tigers who were flying secret missions for the Chinese Air Force. It was kind of a clandestine thing against Ah, the Imperial Japanese Japanese. um, Air Force. So uh, he flew missions, um, Mm. shot down planes, and came back to Winter Garden, a hometown hero. And uh, they gave him a celebration. They awarded him a gold watch at the Garden Theater in a big ceremony. Wow. And then uh, he hung around here for a little bit. Mm-hmm. He was honorably discharged and uh, then decided, well, you know, he still wants to fight for his country. So he signed still during on, World War II. Yeah, still during World War II. Yeah. So he signed on directly with um, what became the American Air Force. You know, uh-huh. the, the U.S. U.S. Air Force. So and, he, uh, so he did his tour. He did his tour. Uh, work, working with... In the clandestine operation with the Chinese against mm-hmm. the Japanese. All right. A great fighter pilot right. came home, ticker tape parade, hung out yeah. a little bit and said, I need to go back there and fight I need with to go back them to again. war, yeah. And he signed on directly with the Air Force. And wow. uh, that's when he got shot down over uh, where Burma meets China I see. in 1944. And that's that's it. brave. That's yeah. how he died. Yeah. And we did a hero. great exhibit on him a few years ago. Did you? That's yeah. Great. Yeah. Wow. Hometown hero. That is that is true, and forever, and he yeah, needs to be exactly. remembered forever. Yeah, excellent. Um, how did you know, we went to the World War II? But I just want to skip back a little bit. Is there any information on how Winter Garden fared during the Great Depression? Yeah, yeah. Um, like any place across the country, jobs were fallen a little bit. Mm-hmm. Um, the crash came. It was mostly financial. We, uh, we were growing food. People got to eat. So yes. there was always that. But sometimes it's too seasonal. You know, it's seasonal. Mm-hmm. So people would be out of work, um, getting relief, getting assistance. Um, the city wasn't doing too great in 1930, 1931. Mm-hmm. I don't think they, I think there's something about them not being able to pay the light bill. Oh, so really? uh, people wanted a better mayor. So they ran um, George Walker. He was a businessman who owned uh-huh. an electric company, an appliance store on Plant Street. They uh, had another ele- you know, the next election, they uh, convinced George Walker to um, run for mm-hmm. mayor. And he didn't really want to do it at first, you know. He liked his appliance store, but um, they convinced him, and he became the mayor. And mm-hmm. I think he won eight terms, seven or eight terms. In those years, it was a year term. Oh, okay. You, you were mayor for a year, and he kept winning, you know, then through the whole depression. Okay, so he's mayor for about eight years, let's say. Mm -hmm. He manages to get from the federal government under Franklin Roosevelt's New Deal, WPA, Works Progress Administration, 
$250,000 over the next few years for civic projects in Winter Garden. No kidding. That's going to put people to work. And that's a lot of money in those that's days. That's a lot of money in those days. So uh, with that money, they put up Trailer City, which attracted well-heeled tourists to come and fish in Lake Apopka mm. and spend money downtown. Uh, Tanner Hall, the auditorium. Mm-hmm. Little Hall, the meeting house next to it, mm-hmm. the pool, you know, the, the municipal pool, improve the waterfront, put a beautiful park over there with the yacht basins, mm-hmm. fix the city dock. And that's out down by the water. Then he put up uh, Walker. He finished repairing and, and improving Walker, what became Walker Field, the football and baseball fields along mm-hmm. Park Avenue. And he got us a uh, fire station in 1938, wow. a city hall in 1937. The guy was great. Two hundred and fifty thousand dollars. That's good. And by the end of the decade, he was like, "Oh, okay, you know, yeah, I'm done. <laughs> did my duty. I'm, I'm yeah, retiring. Yeah, I did what I could. Yeah, back to my appliance shop. Yeah, and we have all those, most all those structures still, yeah. still in use. That's amazing. See, yeah. that's what leaders in a in a, in a meritocracy are supposed to be like. Yeah. You know, they get raised up through the citizens because of their good merit. They reluctantly serve, do well, and they step yeah. down, step aside. That's fantastic. Exactly. Into great well, that's great. You know, I city, never yeah. heard about that. So I'm really, I really appreciate you sharing that story about that mayor. Yeah. The Winter Garden Theater, was that, you, did you mention that was also around that time? When did that come into play? The Garden Theater, the one on the Garden the, Theater. The, yeah, right. the Garden Theater. Um, that was built in 1935. The oh, building okay. right next to it, just east, adjacent to it, there was another movie theater um, called The Garden. Okay. We call it Garden Number One, Garden Theater Number One. Uh-huh. And if you look at Pilar's today, yes. the front of it, mimics what the front of the garden theater used to look like there was some kind of archway so it really is reminiscent of the old theater but yeah the garden theater the second one went up in 1935 i see yeah so there's a lot of thought put into these things you know yeah a lot of people winter garden really has shown to really care about its heritage they really do Yeah. yeah people are really people who grew up here people who come here most all of them, they're really interested in it. People mm-hmm. want to know about their houses, what came before them, who lived in the house. We right. do a lot of research like that. And did you guys uh, at the Heritage help with uh, some of that research? Oh, before? yeah. We have all the records. Um, we keep property records and photographs from families and pictures of houses with what they looked like when they were first built. Wow. We can pull out just about any file. When we did our historic district survey in 1994, Uh we have tons of records on all the properties in the historic district. So first of all, I love the way that we were talking a little bit off camera and you mentioned how it's all about the people, you know, in history. It's not about the dates and everything. Right. Sure, you remember general time periods, but it's about the people. Those are the people who brought us where we are today. I know that you do a lot of these youth uh, programs where they come yes. and the field trips. Tell us a little bit about that and how you bring that message to the kids. Yeah, they're a big part of our uh, mission. Um, uh, we work with second graders and fourth graders, and it involves walking up and down Plant Street for a couple of blocks, locating some of the old buildings that are in photos that are still standing today. With some changes, they have to figure that out. Mm-hmm. They nice. act out the four groups that helped settle the West Orange County area in costume with questions and answers. They do scavenger hunts in the two museums, the Winter Garden Heritage Museum and the Central Florida Railroad Museum. So it's very much hands-on. Mm-hmm. And that's what we like adults you know to experience also it's like, mm-hmm. don't just read about us come and explore with us take a bike tour take this kind of tour take a walking tour we you know mm-hmm. with mr jim but with the kids um i always try to let them know that you know you're you're, you're living history and it's not just a boring set of dates that you have to memorize i say think of people living through history and how you how they just continue families continue then i'll say look at my experience my grandmother was born in 1899 that's the 19th century Mm -hmm. i'm born in 1955 that's the 20th century and i'll say this is now the 21st century and you kids are going to be living into the 22nd century and i'll say my life historical experience and the people i know touch touches on four centuries not 400 years but four centuries That's and they amazing. go oh wow and they get it right. they understand that it's a continuum it's not just a bunch of dates that begin and end yeah. and they get it and when then you show when you show pictures of what came before them yeah. it really clicks That's yeah That's we love yeah. doing that so you mentioned for the kids you tell them you, they act out the four 
The four groups. What are these four groups? Yeah, we have them dressed as um, Native Americans who were here first, uh, farmers who followed them, uh, uh, business people who mm -hmm. followed the farmers to sell them things, and then our tourists who came to fish in Lake Apopka. And these four little groups have to act out questions and answers to their That's peers. Great. That's awesome. That's it's, fun. Yeah, it's a riot. And they <laughs> remember that. They can tell you then, you exactly. know, at the end of an exercise, Lake Apopka, Edgewater Hotel, Native Americans, Timucua. Right. They know all the facts. Excellent. Yep. So Winter Garden is very different than it was. So when did this, what do you attribute to a lot of this, where we are now and where we were then, even maybe 20 years ago, 30 years ago? Yeah, uh, it, it's really a story of resurrection and renaissance. Um, a handful of people, a lot of people who were living in the area um, still after the freezes of the 80s. I mean, you know, the town wasn't completely abandoned, but a lot mm. of businesses did close on Plant Street, most of them. Um, but people worked at Disney or Martin Marietta. Mm -hmm. They were working and they were still living here. And Disney um, had just come out. Disney was in the, the, the early 70s, yeah, 1970. Right. So, yeah. yeah still fresh. So there was that. But um, post freeze, nothing much was happening here. And um, a lot of people just said, well, you know, this is our hometown. It should be alive. What can we do to draw people here? So uh, early 90s, uh, they applied for um, grants from the Main, Main Street program. Mm. which is a national program that, that grants people money to improve their downtowns. And Winter oh, Garden see. was one of them. A festival here and there, improvements to downtown. Uh, that was the early 90s. Eventually that morphed into the Winter Garden Heritage Foundation. Mm. But in 1993, 1994, the West Orange Trail came through. Mm. Uh, we had a freight, but it was rarely used. There wasn't much to bring anymore. There wasn't citrus, and trucks had taken over so much of freight shipping anyway. So uh, we had these railroad tracks that weren't used, and uh, they built a trail along it. Eventually, um, they moved the tracks out just to make it neater mm -hmm. so they could really widen the street, and they brought out the improvements you see today. And by 2003, they had landscaped the center. They put up the clock tower and Centennial Plaza. Was the bike trail an instant success? Um, almost immediately. Um, mm -hmm. This was the early 90s. The Rails to Trails movement was getting a lot of publicity. And um, almost at once, tens of thousands of people started just biking through yeah. a basically um, empty-ish downtown. They still had um, mm -hmm. the tracks at that point and a metal fence mm -hmm. separating the trail from the tracks so that people wouldn't fall over and hurt themselves. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it was a success. I remember coming through and stopping at a place called Downtown Browns, which mm. is where the new New York bagel place is okay, now. Yeah. And they hadn't yet put up those two new buildings next to Downtown Browns, the mm -hmm. one where Axum is and the one where Urban Flats is. That, yes. was, that was an empty spot. And there was a bike rack. And, you know, we were so thrilled to be able to stop in this little historic town and lock up the bike and go in and have. I don't think we even locked up the bike, just leaned the bike on the Probably rack, not, went inside, yeah. had a soda, a little sandwich. And, you know, you're looking around and you're thinking, gee, what's that old hotel over there? And what's this? And it, it's kind of fascinating. Yeah, of course, I'd been through a few times earlier, but right. now I'm immersed in it. Yes. And you're on a bike, so it feels really personal. It took a small group of people to spread the word to a larger group of people that this town is worth saving and investing in. And let's right. bring business back. And yeah. it happened. Without yeah, losing that feel. Yeah, that we it. had all the architecture. We, um, mm -hmm. Basically, everything on Plant Street that you see today is original. There's right. very few new buildings. And the ones that are new, newer, they blend They blend in. There's a lot of thoughtfulness about yeah. that. So uh, people were really invested in this community and weren't willing to see it shrivel up and blow away. Mm -hmm. and they did a wonderful job. Yeah. Now, we're a destination now. Yeah, it sure is. It sure is. And um, when I moved here, I mean, at first it was, you know, I, I was trying to find a good place to, you know, raise a family and start a business. You know, we have Gymnastics USA here on 50. Mm -hmm. And we moved here and I just, I, I fell in love with this place. I mean, there's no other city I'd rather be. Um, it's just so neat to be able to go into one of these places downtown and look around and look at the structure that is, you know, in some cases, 100 years old. Yeah, exactly. You know, and you're here having a nice meal with your family and your friends and your community. I mean, it's just a beautiful thing. Yeah. I want to ask you if there's any way people can 
reach out to the foundation, experience the foundation, support the foundation. Anything yes. you have to say? That yes, helps go folks? to our website. You'll see um, my email and links. Um, you become a member. We have really good affordable membership rates, and it's about supporting us and keeping people's history alive and preserved and collected. Come see the museums. Just check out our Facebook page, which is phenomenal. We get tens of thousands of views on some of our posts, and it's all about local history and events from the city and ours as well. But um, that's probably the most popular way. And awesome. we have an Instagram account also. Jim, thank you for preserving our heritage. I, I truly thank you personally oh, for thank me you for hosting me. Yeah, it's um, yeah. something very important to me, and I like when I get people fired up about it. Yep. So you got me fired up. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Please support this channel by hitting the subscribe button. We need to start talking to each other. We need to talk about our heritage, our history, and our community. Let me know if you have a particular guest you want to see on the program. If there's a particular topic you want to hear about, let me know. Thank you for watching Afterthought. I'm Austin Arthur.